Well, hey, good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to Northridge Church. We're grateful to have you here this morning. Great to be together as a family. I hope you look forward to Sunday as much as I do, just to be together as a family. Welcome home and welcome to the family. If you got your Bibles, Judges chapter 4. Go ahead and grab your physical, your digital Bible. Jump to Judges chapter 4 is where we're going to be diving in and studying God's Word this morning. We also have the Northridge Church app, a great place where you can take notes and reminders of uh, this morning's sermon. And so again, thanks for being here this morning. And last week we, we began a brand new journey where we're looking at some of the heroes of the Bible. But, but not the heroes that we all know about, not the heroes that we know their names and we know their stories, but some of the unsung heroes in the Bible, some of the names in the Bible that we maybe didn't even know existed in the Bible and his stories maybe we've heard or haven't heard at all. And throughout this series, we're, we're looking at the, the time periods of the Bible, all the way from Genesis to the early church in Acts. And we started this series in, in the period of the law. Right, that's a period where God establishes the nation of Israel through his laws. And last week we looked at two heroic women, women two women's name who we, we didn't know, Shipra and Pua. They were midwives and yet they stood in face in defiance of Pharaoh because they feared the Lord. And so today we're shifting into the next period of the Bible. It's called the period of the judges, the period of the judges. And what takes us into this period is the nation of Israel through Moses' leadership is freed from the bondage of the Egyptian empire. And then Joshua, the next leader, leads them into the promised land. And from Joshua, there's a little bit of a leadership vacuum. There's a gap in leadership for the nation of Israel. And there's this constant theme in, the, in this period, the period of the judges, for Israel. In fact, it, it reads like this in Judges 4. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And throughout this period, there's this pattern where Israel would lose its leader and they would wander away from God. They would rebel against God and they would find themselves in captivity or oppression of another nation and God in this period would use a judge to deliver them. You see, a judge is just a deliverer. God would use a selected judge to step in and to free them from the oppression of their enemies. In fact, Judges 2 says it like this, whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and save them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the, judge relent, for the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. And so before we start this morning, I think it's important to have a little bit of cultural understanding of what a judge was. You see, a judge was really three things. A judge was a divinely appointed leader. You couldn't sign up to be a judge. You couldn't build a resume to be good enough to be a judge. God hand-selected, God picked those divinely appointed leaders to lead for him. The second thing a judge was, was a military leader who delivered Israel from its oppressors. And so a judge was not only hand-selected, but they were a military strategist, a courageous and brave warrior, and they were used to deliver Israel out of the bondage or the, the, the oppression of another enemy. The third thing a judge was, was they provided wisdom for the disputes in Israel. They were wise. And so anytime in this nation of Israel there was a disagreement where people couldn't come to terms, a judge would step in and provide wisdom for those situations. And it's with that background in mind, we step into our story this morning, Judges chapter 4. It says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Now that Ehud was dead. So the old judge, Ehud, is dead. And guess what Israel does? They rebel against God. So verse two, it says, so the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazar. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. So here we are in this time period, living in this pattern of Israel. Israel, they lose their leader, and guess what they do? They just wander away from God. They choose to rebel against God. This is the pattern they constantly live in. And, and guess what? Unfortunately, we can relate so well to Israel. Because isn't that often the pattern of our lives? We're good with God, and then all of a sudden we are wandering 
away from God. And, and when Israel wanders away from God, guess what he does? He just simply removes his protection from the nation. And so they find, find themselves constantly wandering from God and now sitting under the oppression of their enemies. This time it's the Canaanites where they are cruelly te- 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 hurting Israel. And so what's amazing to me is it takes Israel 20 years 20 years before they will turn back and cry to God for help. 20 years. And I would suggest maybe some of you are living that way today. Right, through your choices and your actions, you're just like Israel. You're wandering away from God. And when we wander away from God, we think, oh, this is gonna be great, this is gonna be awesome. That's the path to life. But what we find out over the course of, of wandering from God, it doesn't lead to life, it leads to destruction, just like Israel. And so we find ourselves wandering from God and our life gets messier and messier and messier. And you know what we do? Instead of turning to God, we just blame God. Like, God, why don't you fix this? Or we get frustrated with God. And hopefully it doesn't take you 20 years like it did Israel to turn back to God and say, help. Help us. And this is where we're introduced, as Israel cries out for help, this is where we're introduced to one of two unsung heroes in the story. This is the judge of the story. Her name is Deborah. And Deborah is the full package. We're introduced to Deborah in verse four. It says, now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. So here is this judge, this this woman named Deborah. And man, Deborah is the full package. In fact, if I was a young adult and I was thinking about my future spouse, if I'm sitting in Brighton as a young adult guy, and I'm like, man, who do I want to date? And I mean, am I making my list? I'm, I'm writing Deborah down. Like, I want a girl like Deborah, because she is like the full package. Let me just describe Deborah to you. First and foremost, she's a prophetess. And so what that meant for the nation of Israel is God would speak to her, and she would speak what God said to the nation of Israel. Not only is she a prophetess, but she is a judge. She's a military commander, a mighty, brave warrior, and she's a wise woman who ends disputes in the nation of Israel. And so God is going to use Deborah as the judge to deliver the nation of Israel from its oppressors. Verse six, it says how? It says, she, Deborah, sent for Barak, son of Abinom, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go, Take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabar. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. So Deborah, as a judge, she goes to the military commander of Israel. His name was Barak. And this, this, this story is painted out for him. Right, Deborah comes as the judge, as the leader, and she says, hey, God's got a plan to free Israel from the Canaanites. Here's what's gonna happen, Barak. I'm gonna lead Sisera, who's the commander of the Canaanite army, right into your hands, right at the Keshon River. I'm gonna lead him right there, and you will have victory. All you gotta do, Barak, is show up and fight. The Lord God commands you. And you would think Barak would be like, sweet, sounds awesome. God's got this. All I gotta do is show up to the fight. And yet Barak does something just so strange, so interesting. Look what he says to Deborah. This is Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Now, here's what's fascinating about this response. Scholars for years have have been trying to figure out what the heck is Barak doing here? Like what is going on in his head And there's a lot of speculation out there. I'll give you two speculations. The first speculation is a lot of scholars believe that Barak is afraid. He's terrified to go into war against this powerful Canaanite army. And so he's like, I want Deborah to go with me so I feel confidence. The problem with, with that thought process is a lot of scholars say, well, the Bible actually in the hall of faith commends Barak for his faith. In 1 Samuel 12, he's praised as a mighty warrior, a courageous military commander. We know all throughout history, Barak is known for his wise and his courageous leading of the military of Israel. So is is that what really is happening? Other scholars believe that in a male-dominated society, Barak didn't want to be told what to do by a woman. 
in, in a culture where males ruled the day, he did not want a woman telling him where to go and how to act. Truth is, no one really knows. We don't know why Barak said this, but we know what Deborah says afterwards. Verse nine, it says, certainly, she says, I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. So Deborah looks at Barak and she's like, okay, I'll go fight with you. But just know this, Barak, you won't receive the honor for this victory. The honor will go to a woman. And again, this is where culturally we have to step out of our culture and into this culture to truly understand what's going on because in this culture, honor was everything. And for a military commander, like one of the greatest things about winning a victory was receiving the honor for the, the victory that you won. And so for Brock, the commander of the nation of Israel's army, not to receive the honor for a victory that he would win was a shocking blow to him. This was a huge crushing statement from Deborah that not only would he not receive the honor, but the honor would go to a woman. This is where we're introduced to the second unsung hero of this story. Her name is J.L. And so here's what happens is Barak and Deborah, they go to battle together. Deborah goes with Barak and they fight the Canaanite army and they destroy them. They ravage them. But something interesting happens during the battle. The commander of the Canaanite army, his name is Sisera. As he sees his army is losing, he slowly sneaks out of the battle. This is where we pick it up in verse 17. It says, Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazar, and the family of Heber the Kenite, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent. She covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink, covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes and asks you, is there anyone in there? Say no. This is where the story gets real good. It says, but Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground, and he died. Yo, who saw that coming? Let's go, JL, baby. Come on. It's like Lord of the Rings right here. And what's crazy is like, when you read the Old Testament, there's some pretty awesome stories just like this one. And we're not celebrating the death or the murder of someone, but we're celebrating the destruction of evil, the ca evil. The Canaanites represented evil in this culture. And JL, here, here's what happens. Exactly what Deborah said to Brock. That the honor would go to a woman. Not even an Israelite, but a woman, JL. That's a pretty amazing story. You look at the testimony of Deborah as a judge and, and JL who, who wins the victory of the, of the battle. And this is an ancient story. This, this story happened thousands of years ago. But here's what's amazing about the Bible. Here's what's amazing about God's word. His stories thousands of years ago can still change your life today, can still have impact on how you walk with God and how you see God. And so we have to ask the question, as we look at Deborah and Jael's story, their testimony, their example, how does it change my life today? How does their heroic actions impact me and you? And I think it happens in two ways in this story. I think the first way is we, we get a big picture of who God is. We're reminded that God's, we're reminded of God's faithfulness despite a culture that is constantly running from him. We're reminded that we serve a God who is faithful to us despite how we act towards him. But let's go back to the beginning of the story. How, what, how does the story start? It says, again, Israel did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Again, and again, and again, Israel chooses to walk away from God and his ways. And how true is that for us in life? That we constantly choose in our life, knowing God's way, to walk in a different direction. And here's what's amazing about God. He didn't give up on Israel, and he doesn't give up on you. 
He's faithful. It doesn't matter how far you've run from God, how big you think your sin is. It doesn't matter how far our culture runs from God. God is still faithful to be there for us. And that is good news for us, that we, that are sinful people who constantly get it wrong, that we serve a God who doesn't throw in the towel on us, give up on us. No, he remains true to us. In fact, what I love about God, and when I think about one of the best descriptors of God is God as a father. Because we know any good earthly father never gives up on their children. And you guys know that I lost my dad about five years ago. And what's interesting is once you get through like the, the, the first two years of like really hard grief, what's, what's interesting, or at least what I've learned is as I've thought about my dad over these last three years, I, I keep remembering kind of quirky and unique things about him that I don't think I would remember a, a, about him if he was still alive. It's like my memory continues to trigger really cool moments throughout my life with my dad. And one thing that stands out about my dad is if I look back at my life and my relationship with my father, I can pinpoint so many times where I let my father down, where I disappointed him. From when I was a little kid and I would talk back to him or when I was a little bit older in middle school or high school, I'd just rebel against his ways. I'd do things that he told me not to do. Or when it comes from an athlete where I just wouldn't play well on the sporting field. I can name numerous times where I just disappointed my dad. And I can constantly remember my dad saying this and living this. Drew, you will always be my son. I love you. And nothing you do can change that. Nothing you do, no matter how bad or good it is, can change that. And do you realize that's the same message God has for you? That you are his son or his daughter. And it doesn't matter what you do, you cannot escape the faithfulness and the love of our God. In fact, don't believe what I say about it. Believe what God says about it. Paul reminds us of this truth in Romans chapter eight. He says, for I am convinced, I believe this with all I am, that neither death nor life, nor angels or demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor neither height nor depth, nor anything in else in, in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Because you are his son and you are his daughter and nothing you do can change that because today we serve a faithful God who doesn't give up on us. He didn't give up on Israel. Yeah, we can celebrate that today. I think the second thing that we see in this story is when it comes to, to Deborah and Jael, we're reminded that God can use anyone for his plans. God has a unique ability of choosing the least likely people to do the most extraordinary things. I mean, think about these two women, Deborah and Jael. God used them in a culture where men ruled the day. In a culture where women had absolutely no rights, where women were forgot about, overlooked, underplayed, the truth is, is God chose to honor and lift up two women to be the heroes in a male-dominated society. And I don't care what culture tells you, God has a history throughout his word of elevating women in a culture where they are overlooked. And God can choose to use anyone and everyone, from men to women to little children. And can I tell you today, can I just declare this over your life? God can use you. Before you go get into all the reasons why God can't, like I'm not that smart, Drew, you don't get it. I, I, I'm not that good at what I do. I'm not wise. I constantly rebel against God. Like there's no way God could use me. Well, here's the unique thing about God. Is God is different than our culture. You see, when you go to interview for a job, right, you better have the resume and the qualifications to get that job. That's how our culture works. You don't apply for a job you don't have the skills to do, or you look foolish. But what's different about God is God doesn't call the qualified, God qualifies the called. And so the truth is, is you might not be strong enough, you might not be wise enough, it doesn't matter with God, because he has a history of using people who weren't qualified to do jobs that, that they could never get. 
You don't believe me? Let me give you an example. Multiple examples. Think about Moses. He self-admitted he was a stuttering fool who couldn't speak, and yet God used him, chose him to be the voice of an entire nation. Think about Rahab, a prostitute who would bring in the lineage of the Savior of the world. Think about Jacob, a lying, scheming, uh, a stealing man, and God would use him and his testimony to be the name of Israel. Think about fishermen, crappy fishermen, slimy, yucky fishermen. God would use them to create a movement that would change the world. Think about Paul, a murderer of Christians, a persecutor of Christians, and yet he's the most influential leader in the early church. Stop telling me God can't use you. He has a history of using broken, messed up people who aren't qualified to do miraculous things. In fact, his word says so. It says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. And if you don't believe all those stories because maybe they feel like fantasy to you, take my story. Can I tell you today, I am not qualified. I don't have the skills to do what I do today. If you had told me when I was younger, I would stand before thousands of people and read publicly, I would have laughed at you. Because I have what my wife calls severe dyslexia. If you don't understand, I struggle to read. Like it's taxing to just read out loud. Like we have this running joke in my family. When we drive, I don't know why, I like to read signs out loud and I get like five out of 10 wrong. My wife makes fun of me for it. Yeah, you should shame her later for that. You should. (laughs) But when I was growing up, the worst thing that could ever happen to me would be to read publicly. I was embarrassed. And yet God saw me. And he said, I'm going to use you to do something you can't think you can do, Drew. And the same is true for you. In your weakness, God can use you. In your dysfunction, God can use you because he doesn't call qualified people. He qualifies you and he moves you to do exactly what he wants. And can I tell you today, God has a role for you to play. Yes, you who tell yourself you're insignificant. Yes, you with all your flaws and your dysfunction. Yes, you who constantly think you're unworthy. God can use you. And I think the first step in that journey is we got to stop beating ourselves up. I got to stop looking in the mirror and seeing all our flaws, telling us that our will never measure up, will never be good enough. Stop it. The creator of the universe wants to use you. So I want you to think about two questions as I wind down this morning. Two questions that I want to like meditate in your head and your heart this week. I want you to talk about them with your group and your friends. The first question I have for you is, what role does God want you to play? Have you thought about that? Have you thought that, man, God has a role for me. I'm valuable to God. I bring something to the table in his kingdom. And you might ask the question, well, how do I even figure out what what is my role? How do I step into it? And I think it's twofold. One, start where you're at. Many of you tomorrow are gonna wake up and you're gonna go to work. Let God use you right there by being a testimony of what it looks like as a Christian to treat people well, having integrity in your job, not cutting corners, working hard. Or maybe you're gonna wake up and you're gonna be with your, your children Invest in them, raise them as godly men or women who are gonna change the next generation of followers of Christ. Start where you're at, but then remind yourself, you're part of something bigger. We are Northridge Church, we are children of God, and God has a role for you to play in this gathering, in this family. And so what passions do you have? What gifts has God given you through the Holy Spirit? Don't waste them. 
put them to use to serve others in the body of Christ and to help us saturate this dark world with the greatest news of Jesus. Are you playing your role? What role is it that God wants you to play? And second question is simple. Are you playing it? Are you tired of sitting on the bench? Just wondering if God would ever use you? God has a role for you. And don't miss this in this story. Deborah comes to Barak and he says, God commands you to take your army. God has a role for you. And guess what Barak did? He missed it. He missed his role and it cost him the honor. Don't let that be true of you. God wants to use you. Are you playing your role? Think about these two women. Two women in a culture where they probably believed God couldn't use them. Where they were overlooked, not valued. And God said, I'm going to use you. What role does God have for you? And are you playing it? Father, thank you that you use unqualified people to serve, to love, to guide, to lead. God, at the end of the day, we're all unqualified to be a part of your plan, and yet you amazingly still choose to use us. So God, I pray that we would take that seriously, that you do want to use us. This is not some motivational speech. This is the truth of your word. That you have a role for us to play. I pray that we would be bold and courageous enough to step in it today. In the name of Jesus.